Welcome to the Intentional Mama Podcast, a fun way for girls to get together and dive into spiritual growth in ourselves and our homes. To learn more, check out the Intentional Mama Facebook page, the Root Bible social media pages, or at rootbible.com. Now, here is Pastor Kate Richter. Hello! I am so glad that you are joining me here for Intentional Mama on the new day in class with us at rootbible.com. Hello to you joining us on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook. Hello. Yeah, go ahead and say where you're coming in from, where you're tuning in from, where you mighty moms are watching from. And not just watching, hopefully if you're not driving, you've got a notebook, you've got your Bible. We're going to be intentional about growth as moms. Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, that's a nice place. We drive through there a lot on our way to minister. Hello, Alicia. Awesome. Over on Rumble. Hello, Eric. Erica. (laughs) Awesome. Welcome. Where are you coming in from? Stephanie. Very cool. Oklahoma. Miss Kenzie. So glad to be here. So cool to see everyone get on here. Now, mamas, I'm Pastor Kate. I'm coming from rootbible.com, where my husband and I laid everything down to make it our mission to see the church expand from a Sunday morning encounter and experience to a life we live with our families all week long. And so that is the vision behind rootbible.com, Rooted Lives in Christ. Monday through Sunday, not just Sunday, and how to actually live it. And so when I'm coming to you now, moms, this is about what we are drawing out in this semester all week long. On Mondays, we have classes. On Tuesdays, we have classes. On Wednesdays, we have classes. And we're talking about the Word of God packs a punch. Okay? That is the, the theme behind learning our authority in Christ and the power of our words. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that as a mom, it's it's a punch to my own face because a day filled with words, I also have ample opportunity to mess up. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today because we've been given the power to reverse even a mess up, a slip up, a I'm using my own words. I'm reacting out of my flesh. Can I get any moms that can relate with that? Not your intention. You didn't wake up that morning to say, I'm going to let my (laughs) five-year-old take my last ounce of Christianity and my flesh will be all that's left to react. I'm sure none of you. Um, Oh, thank you for telling me, Alicia. That was awesome. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. I am most terrible at... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, the technical side. So thank you for saying that. Okay, so you moms know that we have the opportunity to respond in our flesh, our soul, or by his spirit, right? And a lot of times when it's in our flesh and soul, it's a reaction, but we have a way to reverse that. So we're going to talk about that today and the power of actually thinking correctly about ourselves, our position in Christ, and how that equips us to then be ready to respond, not react. And so sometimes when we are thinking incorrectly, we position ourselves from the get-go to believe a lie, right? That we can't do this, that I can't win against my five-year-old, my 13-year-old, whatever it is, right? And that day we go in defeated from the beginning. Well, that's just wrong thinking, isn't it? That's just thinking of defeat, not victory. And though your flesh, your carnal nature, the Bible calls it, or your soul, the unrenewed part, might have feelings of that, that indeed is not your truth. As you sit as a child of God enthroned in places in heaven at the right hand of the Father in Christ Jesus, that is not your truth. 
Your truth is you're equipped with everything you need in Christ Jesus. Your truth is you have power and the power of God in you comes out by his spirit in rivers of living water. You bring life to your home because life lives in you. You are equipped with everything you need and you speak with confidence and authority. You are loved and positioned. You've been gifted for this time to be a mom to those kids and create within your home a very atmosphere for the Lord to rule and reign. That's your truth. And so knowing that, we're going to go forward learning about what? How our words impact our environment today. So let's start with, you know what? We went over some questions with the kids and uh, the teens. And honestly, the kids knew more than the teens. I'm just going to throw some out at you. And if you want to put them in the, thank you, Alicia, is much better. Thank you, thank you. Um, if you want to throw your answer in the chat, just test yourself in the knowledge and wisdom of him. When we gain knowledge, the ability for revelation is there, right? So the first question is this, what does the word authority mean? Okay, what does that word really mean? So when the Bible is referring to uh, you know, the authority being handed over to us in Christ Jesus, what does that mean? What does it mean to have authority? Or what does the word authority mean? Okay, some of you are thinking, you're like, wait a minute. Okay, let's see. Yes, called, equipped, anointed. Good job, Elisa. Authority, the actual definition in short, is the legal power to rule and command or the legal right to rule and command with power, okay? The legal right to rule and command with power, okay? So, you know, like if your kids aren't renewed in a certain area yet and they'd be like, you don't have authority to tell me that, they would be wrong. <laughs> you have the legal right to have power, or to have um, rule and command in power over them, don't you? For a time while they're in your house. So that authority that we've been given from the Father through Christ is our right to rule and command by his leading and power. Okay? There is never not a time that you do not have authority from God extended and available to you to rule and command. Okay, Power is different than authority, but authority is the right to rule and command with power. All right, here's another one. Who has all of God's authority in this world? Who has all of God's authority in this world? When we read about it in the Word, we talked about this last week, there's a transference of authority in this world that took place. Okay? Who has all of God's authority in this world? Who is it? Some people say, God, God is in control. Okay, he's the creator, and he's carved out time for a length of time out of eternity. It's called an age or the ages, right? So he has carved that out, but he's given authority to who? Us. And he gave up his own son to do it. You and I, in Christ Jesus, have all authority in this world. How? By the legal right to rule and command by his power. Does, now, if somebody is put in a place of authority under a power, so they've been extended the right to rule and command under a government, for instance, because the government rests on Jesus' shoulders, does that mean they have the authority to do anything they want? No. 
That means they have the authority to enforce that government where they are. So the government that rests on the shoulders of our Lord Jesus is what we have the authority to advance in this earth because of what Jesus did. Now, that's a big deal. Why? Because we can get in our word and find out what is part of the enemy's kingdom that we now have authority over. Because sin, death, destruction, and loss is done away with, what do I have the right to rule and command and not allow in my life because I'm enforcing the government I'm now a part of through Christ Jesus? Do you see how that works? Okay, I am under that government. So this isn't like I get to command whatever I want. This is I find out from my government, which is the government of the kingdom of heaven, what I have the right to have authority to command and rule over. Now, this is why it's so important for us to understand what the word is actually saying, because now we're able as moms to take that authority and know I have authority over sickness, death, destruction, and loss. Sickness doesn't belong in my home. I have authority over doubt. Doubt doesn't belong in my home. I have authority over fear. Fear doesn't belong in my home. You see, when you start to understand what you have authority over, it is over the government that the enemy has of his own because through Christ, the government that sat on his shoulders has defeated the enemy's government. So now if that government of the enemy tries to come into my home, I know I have the legal right to rule and command with God's power that that government has no right in my home. How awesome is that? All right, this was another question we asked the kids and the teens. The word of God is also who? Now this throws off a lot of people. But this is so powerful because we know the word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word gives us clues that it is actually someone. The word. Okay? The word of God is also Jesus. Remember at the beginning, the word was with him. And as God spoke the word, the Holy Spirit made the word come into being Okay, when Jesus came to the earth, that was the word made flesh. Jesus is the manifest word of God. Why is that important? Because he is seeing with our eyes the word of God in the flesh. I don't know about you, but I read the word sometimes and realize I'm seeing words and my imagination begins to see in the inner man what those words mean. Well, Jesus was the manifest presence of those words. And he is alive and active. And he is teaching us as we study, as we meditate on, as we speak out his word, it is life to us. That is relationship with our Lord. He is the word. All right. And here's the last one. Who gave the devil authority in this world? For the short time from, you know, Adam to Moses and from Moses to Jesus, uh, the enemy had a certain amount of authority handed over to him. Who gave it to him? God didn't give it to him. Who gave the enemy authority in this earth realm? Well, it was man. It was man. Okay, so just like the created human made in the image of God gave authority to the enemy to rule and reign over him for a while, Jesus came and got that authority as a man back and then gave that authority to you and I. So who now has the authority to rule and command over the enemy? We do. 
Don't give him back any authority. Don't be tricked. Don't be fooled. Don't be lured in by your flesh or your emotions. And don't let your kids do it either. You stand firm on the authority that you have been given back by Christ Jesus. And we teach our kids to do the same. Okay, this isn't, this isn't just like speaking anything we want and it comes to pass. It is about enforcing the government that rests on the shoulders of Jesus. And we can help those in our home do just that. You guys did a good job with those quiz questions. I wish I had a prize for you <laughs> or something, okay? So the main cue that we went over with your kids and your teens and we can make alive in our home this week is... Why should I say what the word of God says? Why should I say what the word of God says? A good one for us mamas would be, why should I not say what the word of God doesn't say? Okay, we can be filled with so many words, can't we moms? (laughs) We have so many words that can pour from our mouths, whether it's emotions, thoughts, guidance, our own wisdom, right? Um, We have available to us so, so many words. But the importance is that we learn to turn those words into power. And the way that we're going to do that is to make our word be his word that our inner beauty would come from speaking from the very depths of our heart, truth and wisdom, wisdom that comes from God, not natural wisdom of experience and, and our own um, workings of our lives, right? Before Jesus, that's all we had, wasn't it? This is what I went through. This is what I dealt with. I once experienced this. Now, are those bad things? No, but make sure that you're wrapping them in the victory of the word, not the defeat of the flesh or the carnal nature, okay? So why should we say what the Bible says? Well, let's look. We're going to go right into a scripture because we know that speaking God's word is powerful. Speaking what he says brings about power. So let's go ahead and look at this with my, my, look at what my husband did. He did such a good job. He gave us the scripture. Yes, he did. Let's look at this. Mark eleven twenty three. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Now, this is the danger as moms with our many words, right? Is because we we begin to believe the many things we're saying, even though the many things we're saying aren't necessarily his word. I can do that in my own life with my husband. It's like almost sometimes like I can go so long before I just verbally throw up emotions. Anyone else can relate with that? I'm not proud of it. I just want to be an honest, you know, a bump in the road for my walk with Christ is I can sometimes just like speak the word, have the faith. I know it's true. And then I come along and I emotionally speak doubt, which brings destruction and loss. Okay. Where first in me, because when I hear myself speak those words, I begin to believe them. So this verse reminds me not to do that. I tell you the truth. Anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Now, Let's look at the power of this verse by breaking it down with each other, okay? In our home, we'll say, I believe you can have what you say. So what are you saying? All right, I believe I can have what I say. So what am I saying? When my kids say things like, oh, I hate doing school. Oh, I hate, you know, like whatever it is. Oh, I really don't like, you know, I'm like, hey, 
You hear yourself saying that. So what is the attitude you're developing within yourself towards that thing? Hatred, destruction, and loss. Okay? Now, maybe you can't say with confidence, I love doing this. But instead of murmuring and complaining, you can bring it to the Lord and say, help me find joy in this. Help me learn this with you, right? That is how you can line your mouth up without necessarily lying. Because we have been taught in the name it and claim it, you know, um, um, schooling that it's like, oh, I love school and and I love waking up early. And I, <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, none of those things are true. So you don't even believe the words coming out of your mouth. You doubt them right away, right? You're trying to speak something that's not necessarily scriptural, right? But you can turn and say, Kate, you will enjoy learning. You will enjoy finding the father and the day he has for you early in the morning. Kate, you will enjoy learning new things and seeing Christ in them. Father, won't you help me see you in everything I'm learning so that as I put my hand to it, it is blessed as your promise in your word says it will be. And you're like, oh, that sounds really spiritual, Kate, because it is. It's knocking and cutting the flesh off the throne, the soul getting knocked right off of its, you know, power horse and going, nope. God, what do you say about this? You say, everything I put my hand to is blessed. That means that includes education. I can do this for your glory. Why? Because you say in your word, everything that you do, do it as unto me for my glory. And we can encourage each other in those. Why? Because we want to line our mouth up with what is true, whether we feel like it or not. So back to Mark eleven twenty three. 23, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt. So first we say, and then it's like Jesus knew that after we say something with authority in his kingdom, you get out of here, go be cast into the sea. We would have an opportunity in our soul to doubt. We'd have an opportunity instantly. So what does he say right after you say, right after you command with his authority and his power? What does he say? Do not doubt because he knew you would have the opportunity to. Now let's look what doubt really means, okay? In the Greek, what does doubt really mean? So I feel like this brings it home for me because you hear the word doubt, 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 but you don't really stop and let it the meaning of it absorb within you so that you can be on guard not to do it, okay? This is the definition according to the Greek word, I'm going to mutilate it, diakrino, okay? That's the Greek word, okay? Diakrino. Now with Google, you think I would just push play and find out how to pronounce it, but we're not going to do that, okay? What does that mean? It means Distinguish, discern one thing from another by hesitation or wavering. So now what happens is you speak with confident authority. You say, I command you, but then you have this opportunity to go, well, I discern that it's still there. I can distinguish in the natural that this is probably impossible. And so... um, I'm going to go back and forth in my thinking and probably reflect that in my saying. Okay? Thoroughly back and forth, which intensifies. Thoroughly judging back and forth. So here you go. I command you, mountain, be cast into the sea. It's not really moving, and that's a large hill. And I don't know that geographically that might affect the earth. That's probably going to affect a lot of animals and creatures. Uh, it probably wouldn't be something God wants me to do anyway. I mean, it is in the way of me accomplishing his will, but you see what happens there? That inner talk. You know what you have to do with that inner talk that wants to be doubt that comes out your mouth? You got to shut it down. 
So command says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt, does not what? Judge back and forth, hesitate or waver. Okay. And even if the temptation comes, nope, you have to go. Your job is to go get in that sea. I don't care about the geographical consequences. I don't care about the critters. God will take care of them. I care that my job is to command you out of the way. See the difference there? Okay. I love that you said rebuke. The actual definition of rebuke is to tell something that's being naughty. <laughs> that's the actual definition. So when Jesus was on, this is from Alicia, okay, when he rebuked the wind and waves, at first, essentially, and you can look this up in the Greek, he's saying, you're being naughty and unruly, so uh, chill out. Peace, be still. So he rebukes it by saying, you're being naughty and unruly, and you know you legally don't have that right. So then he tells it what to do. So when you rebuke something, follow it up with a command of what it has to do. Because just rebuking it is just saying you're being naughty. So it'd be like telling a five-year-old, you're being naughty, and then not giving them further instruction, right? So when you rebuke something, you're like, I rebuke that sickness in Jesus' name. You're saying you're being naughty and you're not allowed here. And then you follow it up by telling it what to do. That's great. I'm glad that you put that. Okay, so we've got doubt. Then we have the word believe. Okay, we also hear that word a gabillion times, right? If you'll just believe. Why do I love that though? Because God is so gracious. Remember when Jesus uh, was um, brought that boy that the disciples couldn't deliver from his infirmity and they didn't understand why. But the father responds to Jesus and says, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Like I came to you because I believe in you and whatever is within me that's causing me not to believe, help me. And then did Jesus rebuke him and say he's being naughty and tell him to go away from him? No, he helped him. He was gracious with him. So God knows that we want to believe and that we need his continual help to remain there. Okay, so let's look at the word believe. B is to live or exist like your life, which conveys the thought in accordance or conformity or agreement with. So it literally means to live in conformity or agreement with something. Okay, so when you believe, you know, we're, we're accustomed to, to think of belief as a simple mental acknowledgement, right? Oh yeah, I believe. I believe in my mind, right? Which is what I think this gentleman was saying to Jesus. I believe in my mind. That's what walked me here with my son, right? But it goes beyond that, okay? Its roots lead us to action. That which the mind accepts, we must obey. So if we do not doubt and we actually believe what we say, then it's going to cause us to take action. And that's faith right? Faith cannot be alive without action. Faith is dead without action. So he says, you say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt, does not waver by what he sees and reason within himself, right? In his heart, but believes, what's that mean? I conform and agree with my ability to have authority more than what I see. So I am walking straight knowing that mountain has to move right? And then what? I believe that what I said will happen. And so it will be done for me. Now, if you break it down, you realize there's no reason to doubt. There's no space for doubt. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has delivered unto us the authority to command with power his kingdom on earth. For our good pleasure, no, for his. And he takes good pleasure in the blessings of his kids. So when we move forward in authority, we are teaching those in our home that they can too. For what? The glory of the king. We advance his kingdom with authority and power. 
and he takes care of us. So if there is something that's challenging his kingdom, sickness, poverty, death, destruction, loss, something's getting in the way of the victory that he has paid for, well, I have the authority backed by his power to rule and command, and I will not doubt that. I believe that what I say is finished. I live in complete conformity to his word, and therefore, it will be done. Woo! Okay, that's fun. That's fun, right? Mark. So let's look at it. Don't doubt once, believe once, but say twice. How do we release authority on this earth? You're looking at it. This right here. This is how you release authority. It's how God released it from Genesis 1 to Revelation. He commands with what? His mouth. That's how anything gets done. And so the enemy who doesn't have a voice in this world, unless it comes through a created being in the image of God, wants to use the mouth of those created beings right? The enemy wants first your thinking and then your mouth. Because when you speak with power, you create. But we're not going to give it to him. Doubt gives the enemy power. Why? Because as soon as we doubt, it affects our heart and it comes out our mouth. We're not going to do that. How do we defeat doubt? With faith with believing, with unwavering, with saying, I don't care what I see. Father, help me stand firm in you. All right. Then we had our verse that we are meditating on all month long because we want to recognize with the Bible this question. What on earth have we been saying Boy, if the Lord isn't working on me as we teach this semester, okay? Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for death or life. That is the words coming from our tongue, required to speak, okay? That power is coming from the tongue, but where is that power? What, what power are you empowering? Are you empowering darkness, destruction, and loss, or are you empowering life? He's given you the ability, just like he gave Adam the ability in the garden, you have the ability as well. I have the ability as well. So write this down in your notes. What on earth have I been saying? Remind yourself, oh, if I don't have to shuddy season it, sometimes in the middle of a murmur and complain session after the kids have gone to bed. <laughs> Anyone relate with that, right? Like, you know, our world calls it venting, right? I just have to vent. Now, guess what? That's not in the word. That's called murmuring and complaining. And the Bible actually says that's an improper form of communication. And when you do, what happens? You indulge death. Ew, no thanks. And you can help your kids know that also. When they are meditating on this verse, encourage them. What are you indulging in? What is it that you're speaking? And how are you seeing that come alive in your life? Are you seeing that you're starting to dread doing uh, work, ho uh, homework, school work, whatever? Are you seeing that you start to dread it? What's been coming out your mouth the last few weeks? Are you seeing that you're starting to see your sibling in a different light or an unfair light because you keep saying certain treatments are unfair? Now it's begun to change the way you think about your sibling in that situation. Does that seem like life or death? Can you see that when you are um, saying things, you begin to experience them on a daily basis? Why? Because your mouth releases power. The only enemy, the only power the enemy has is your mouth in your life. 
That's it. Why does he go about as a roaring lion, as a roaring lion, looking for who he may devour? Because he's a listening for who is speaking words that he can take a hold of and make reality in your life. How? By continuing to whisper those thoughts to you as you speak them, as you empower death through your words. Now, I don't mean this in condemnation at all. I told you I could and did struggle with this. This is to bring you up and out of it the way that Christ wanted to when he came and died so that we would have the ability to speak life. Remember, before sin and death were taken care of, we had no choice. Even if we tried to do right, even if we spoke right, the result was death. Why? Because we were under the power of death. Now, under Christ Jesus, our Lord, a new government, we have the ability to speak one or the other by choice. Which one will you seed your life with? Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for death or life. If you're registered for our class, We have this in song. We have it in ringtone. You can download it so that you begin to meditate on it in your heart, hearing it over and over again in your mind, in your heart, and come out your mouth. You just sing it over and over because that's how it really moves from your head to your heart. Okay. All right. So death and life, your tongue has power. We know that that's not to weight lift, although I need to get back to weight lifting. We know that that's power over the enemy. That's power over the enemy's kingdom because we are part of a new kingdom of which the enemy's kingdom is subject to. The kingdom that rests on Jesus' shoulders is the kingdom we get to speak in authority to advance in our lives and in those in our home. That's where we start, mamas, right? That's where we begin. Now, you can ask your kids to show you or tell you about the Christian attack video, okay? We showed them in reality how it looks in some people's lives. It's like, you're sitting there and a doubtful thought comes and you're like, golly, I don't even know if I'm momming right. I don't even know if I'm supposed to homeschool. I don't even know if that conversation I had the other day even brought life. Am I even supposed to be doing this? See, like doubt comes and it comes in a whisper, doesn't it? Okay, so you could just sit there and meditate on that thought and do nothing, couldn't you? And then what would follow doubt? Fear. Oh, if I'm not doing this right, I'm teaching my kids to do what's wrong, and they're not even going to know how to do this at all. They're going to be failures. They're going to, and what's going to follow that? Anything the enemy can bring your way. What's that tinge in my stomach? Should I make doctor's appointments for us all? Oh, I haven't been feeling good. Oh, my middle son has been having a runny nose. What should, do you see what I mean? I am just letting my thoughts run away with me. Anything that comes in, I'm just letting my meditative thoughts join in, okay? My spiritual father, Brother Hagen, used to say, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can absolutely stop it from making a nest in your hair. So God has given us this power to take these whispers and do something with them. When they come, we don't just let them stay and create a home in our minds. When we hear them come out the mouths of our teenagers or our kids, we don't let it go unaddressed so that it can continue to be a meditation of their mind and possibly move to their heart and be coming out their mouth. No, instead, when doubt comes or we hear a glimpse of it in our kids, we respond with, no, I refuse to doubt. James says that if you doubt, you're like the waves of the sea and you're unable to have anything or receive anything. Why is that? Because God's keeping it from you? No, he's already given you all things because you're not in one place long enough. The first scripture we looked at in Mark 11 to believe and receive. 
You're, I think this, I think that. I saw this, I say that. So you're never in one place steadfast long enough to receive what God's got for you. And I refuse to let that happen. I have been called to love my kids, to homeschool them. I have been equipped to do so. I am not a failure. I'm victorious in Christ, and I am led by his spirit. That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me, and the Bible says my sheep know his voice. He called me to homeschool, and I will not waver or doubt. See what happens there? Now I'm not meditating and going down a road where the enemy who goes about like a roaring lion and his little demonic cohorts who are nothing can be defeated immediately and have no place to root themselves when I respond with the power of the word. Two things are happening. In the supernatural realm, the power of the word is cutting through, keeping spiritual principalities and powers from having any authority. And the second thing happening is I'm hearing my own words. And so are those in my home that I am standing firm on the word of God and not my feelings and not my wrong thinking and not a a doubt, a thought of doubt that has snuck in and tried to see like a bait if I would take it. See what's happening there? That's why speaking the word of God is such power. All right, let's look at this. Let's look at this. First Corinthians 15, 58. You know, when I wrote this scripture, I, I spent about three months in first Corinthians and I still didn't remember that 15 went all the way to 58. <laughs> okay, here we go. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Kate, I thought we were talking about speaking, saying, believing we are. Okay, this is, this is Paul's edification after he has really laid into the church at Corinth in this first letter. He's really laid into him and now he's edifying them like, guys, you can do this. Be strong and immovable. Always be enthusiastic when serving the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is useless. So when you are motivating your kids to speak life, to look up a scripture, to combat a wrong thought, to seek his word, to speak his word, when you're doing that, you can remind them, this is how we aren't useless in God's kingdom. This is how we are employed as warriors in the government that rests on Jesus' shoulders. We stand strong and immovable in what? His word. And we're enthusiastic and joyful about it because why? That's our strength. And we know that as we do this, this is not useless. This isn't just punching the air. This is purpose. And very powerful and important, not only in our lives, but in the kingdom of light advancing in this world. So when you hear things like stand firm, stand fast, a lot of times people don't know what that means. It means not to waver. Remember what we talked about? Doubt, the definition of doubt. Wavering, right? Okay, that, is that standing firm? Is like, oh, we might, oh, we kind of, should we, shouldn't we, should it, shouldn't it, I said, but did he really, that's not standing firm, that's not immovable, do you see what he's saying there, he's combating doubt when he's saying stand firm, strong tower, be immovable, he's telling you on the firm foundation of Christ who is the word, stand, not by what you see, not by what you think, his word, not by what you feel, his word. And then nothing you do there will be useless. Stand firm. Okay? Oh, I love that. Okay. Now here's the thing. A lot of people just don't know how to stand firm. I see the word. I read the word. I don't know how to apply that to my life necessarily. Well, we made up this little like rap reminder, which just simply says, seek the word, check yourself. Okay. So you're going to seek the word. Then you're going to say, are my thoughts, is what I'm saying, is what I'm doing lining up with that? 
the not murmuring and complaining, the not doubting, the not wavering. Am I believing? Am I constantly in communication with the Lord always, meditating on his word? I'm checking myself, right? So seek the word. Check yourself. Speak the word and show the devil what you got. Okay, he, the, remember last, last time we talked about both heaven and hell are asking, who are you? Even the earth cries out, wanting you to know who you are in Christ Jesus. But how you answer will determine what you're feeding, life or death. Stand firm on life. And you do that by seeking the word and then speaking it, knowing it is so. It shall be done, right? In our own lives, our, the biggest mountain that we've ever dealt with has always been doubt. I think it was in this book. I even wrote it in the beginning. And so um, the other day, I just wrote, mountain of debt, get out of the way in Jesus' name. Wealth will be created through me, so go and be cast into the sea, okay? So now what happens? If I see a bill, if I see a challenge with my husband's job, if I see something in ministry or in partnership, I have the opportunity to go, oh, Lord, you showed me that. You showed me in your word. You could speak to it, but now look. <laughs> look. Okay, like it's anything new to him, right? Okay, like they did when they put Jesus on the cross. Yeah, look. Oh, yeah, the government rests on his shoulder. They killed him. <laughs> you know what I mean? If we're moved by what we see. In fact, yeah, Jesus was really, really frustrated three days later with his followers for that. Okay, so... Now, when you decide to believe the word, when you write it down, when you declare it, now what's your opportunity? To stand firm, despite what you see, despite the waves, despite the storm, right? Why does he say that? Because you will have opportunity in this world to doubt, but don't. Don't. Stand firm. Be led by his spirit. Speak his word in faith. And if by chance you waver, repent. There it is. That's what I promised you from the beginning on those days when you just mess up and you're like, <gasps> I wish I could just <laughs> all that bad get, get back in there. You know what I mean? When you just, you have that vent moment of the flesh and all of a sudden like bloop, bloop, alarms go off and you're like, what have I done? <laughs> right? You know, it's like, why did I even talk like that? Why did I talk to my son like that? Why did I talk to my spouse like that? Why did I talk to myself like that? Why did I say that? We have the power of repentance. It is so powerful that it can take a seed of doubt and uproot it in a moment. So the minute you catch yourself with your children, with yourself, with your spouse, the minute that that verbal throw up goes, whoop, 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 this is using your tongue for death. This is using your tongue for death. When the Holy Spirit's going, stop it. You're just making your flesh feel good, but it's going to cause problems. You go, whoop. Oh my goodness, forgive me. I repent. I was just lining my life up by speaking the opposite of what God's promised. I was lining my life up with the enemy, with death, destruction, and loss, and I was trying to bring it in this situation. That's not right. Whether it's to my kids because I react instead of respond. Maybe what they did wasn't right, but I didn't respond by the leading of the Spirit. Well, I'm a son of God. I respond by His Spirit only, right? Well, then I repent. I, what happens? That's not just bringing the words back in. That's making death have no power to take that seed and make it something. Just like that. Now, do we live so we can live to mess up and repent? No. Paul addresses that in Romans. But when we have a heart to do what's right, to walk in faith, to say life, and we catch ourselves fleshing out or souling out for a moment, <gasps> repent. That's humility. I'm outside of your will, God. I'm outside of speaking life. I'm outside of advancing your government of light and life. And I repent. Forgive me. I know that I'm stronger that, than that because you're in me. 
I know that in a moment of weakness, you are strong. And I ask that those moments of weakness become less and less. And I lean fully on you. Gone. Done. Reversed. Has no power. And then you turn around and seed that ground with truth. What's truth? The power of his word. Okay. How do we know it's powerful? Because he told us so. In Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is full of living power. It is sharper than the sharpest knife, cutting deep into our innermost thoughts and desires. It exposes us for what we really are. Whew. Man, I'm telling you, that word that is alive in you will cut off All of those parts that are undesirable, that you no longer want, those parts that keep rising up and coming out your mouth, when you're in his word and you're speaking his word and you're standing firm on his word, it's like a knife for the spirit, a sword, the Bible calls it, of the spirit. And we take that word and it cuts off the parts of us that don't belong there in the flesh, in the soul that are affecting our thinking, our emotions and our momming and our spousing, right? And that word is so powerful. It cuts those things off. We realize, oh, how's that hiding there? I thought that was humility. That's pride. Why was I even thinking on that? And that word begins to cut those thoughts and those desires away. And now all you want is him, his word, his will, his heart's desire, his purpose and plan because of the power of his word. Oh, I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. And then we get to in turn, remind our kids of this. Okay. You're struggling in an area. Well, guess what? That's okay. His word is strong enough to cut through and get that out. So let's go find a word that's going to allow the Holy Spirit to cut that out once and for all. You see how that works? It's not going to get cut out of our kid's life by us saying, oh, they're there. Let me pray for you. Though, yes, pray for them. But give the Holy Spirit something to wield the sword of the spirit, the word of God to cut it out once and for all in your kiddo's life, in your life, in your spouse's life. That's the power of the word. That's the power of declarations. We love to take the word, write it down and turn it in to our own declaration over our life, knowing that this truth is ours. Yes. And amen. Because of Christ Jesus. We can't cut it out ourselves or think on, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just going to ignore that thought. That doesn't belong here. Yes, well, you got halfway there. It doesn't belong there. But the only way it's going to be cut out is with the power of the word of God. And our children, our spouses must know this. We must be secure in this because as moms in our home, we must teach our kids that the only thing that's going to transform us and set us free is his word. We're saved. We're his children. But if the only way we're going to be empowered to live with that authority to command death, destruction, and loss is with his word. Okay. Okay. If you got any questions, you've been listening, type them in the chat. Thank you to those that are putting the scripture verses down as we say them. That's super helpful. Thank you to my husband for giving us this. I made the mistake of wearing a jacket that my lighting doesn't like. So (laughs) we'll figure that out later. Okay. Let's try and move this. Let's see. Hold on. I'll try to be all creative. It will probably make it worse. Okay. Okay. No, made it worse. There we go. Nobody tell. Nobody tell my hubby. (laughs) He works hard on this stuff. Okay. Okay. So we're not just teaching the Bible. We're living the Bible. We're not just teaching the Bible. We're consuming the Bible. We're not just teaching and reading the Bible. We're enforcing the power of its word in our lives and in every life around us. So are we going to continue to do that or just say what we want to say? and empower a kingdom that we're not a part of. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Revelation 12, 11, our last one for the day. 
They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Okay, first of all, what's a testimony? A lot of people hear this, and even we work on it in classes, you know. A testimony is not what you yourself can accomplish on your own. That's not a testimony. So, I mowed my lawn. (laughs) I emptied the dishwasher. That is not a testimony. A testimony is something that you are empowered to accomplish because of God himself. He has equipped it and empowered it, and you couldn't have done it without him. That's a testimony, okay? Telling others about the goodness of God in your life. That's it. That's it. But that goodness is what? His power. That's the goodness. Not your own uh, flesh works. Not your own solical ideas. His word. So where do we find out about God's goodness? His word. How do we testify? We show the power of his word at work in our life. I couldn't have done this, but his word says this. I stood on it and that's what happened. That's the good news of the gospel. Here's what Christ did to set you free. Where do we find that? In the living word. So find your children's testimony in the word every day. What they're struggling with, what you're struggling with. Find your testimony. Find what is in the word that only you can do by his power. And the power of his word cuts away the things that don't belong there and equips us to live that life of victory. He died so that we could live. That life of joy, which strengthens us every day while we are still in this world where time exists. That joy that drowns sadness, that that complete confidence in the Lord that no matter how crazy the world gets, we can stand firm on him and his word. And we command those things far from us because he's promised they won't impact us, even while we're here and they're happening all around us. You ready for your kids to know those things? I am. You ready to be secure in those things yourself, moms? I know you are. So what do you need to do? You need to say out your mouth. Do not doubt. Say out your mouth. Say it. Don't doubt it. Say it again. Okay? And if you're tempted to doubt it, say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Stand firm. Do not doubt. Now, our go and do. You can't just be in here. You can't just, Alicia says she's ready. Yes. You can't just say, wow, that was a good sermon and walk away. You've got to have an action plan. And your action plan is this. Write down somewhere in your house, seek his word, check ourselves, speak the word, show the devil what we've got. Seek the word, check ourselves, speak the word, show the devil what we've got. Okay, when we're seeking the word, we're going to be constantly checking ourselves to line up with the word, aren't we? So when our kids, you know, come to us with an issue, with a problem, with an emotion, and when we're struggling with it, when our spouse is struggling with it, what are we going to do? We're going to check the word. Let's go check the word on that. Okay, let's go seek it out, find the answer. Then let's check ourselves. What's happening within us that we're thinking this, that we're doing this, that we're saying this, so we can surrender this to the Lord. We're going to speak the word he showed us that we saw out. We're going to speak it out. We're going to get it on the refrigerator. We're going to make a card. We're going to make a declaration of it. We're going to speak it out, and we're going to show the devil he has no kingdom territory in the government, which I am a part of, and that's my king's government. He is under our feet. And this is how we assure that we stand firm with him there, under our feet. Thank you, Lord, for those that have joined me today. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I love that. Put it as a poster. Thank you, Lord, for these sweet, powerful women who are ready to lead their homes, lead themselves, help guide their relationship with their spouses in your word. Thank you, Father, that you have equipped us to do just that. And I thank you by the power of your spirit, they are anointed to speak the word of God with authority to command 
those promises be alive in their homes, that the enemy's government has no territory and they walk in complete confidence that your promises for them and their family are yes and amen. I thank you, Lord, for those that are are maybe struggling with the many words as I was, that you will lead them into a shuddy season, that you will help them not be ready to speak on their own, but have a time of preparation to be ready to speak by your spirit. I thank you, Lord, but by that power in your love that is in them, it will reset them to be wealth. Uh, what do I see there? What is that? I see like um, a bank. Oh, that's it. A bank, a treasure of God's wisdom in your home. Moms that are listening, wives that are listening, this shuddy season that we surrender to the Lord in humility will allow us to store up a treasure of wisdom. Thank you, Lord, that we will in turn pour out into those in our home and in our lives, seeing life and life abundantly and be all that we and our families know in Jesus name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Those that have joined me over in root class, I'm going to head over there. Now we answer, you know, real rubber meets the road questions and make sure we're ready to progress these things in our home. For those of you that are joining me on social media, thank you. I love that you joined me here. Please share, please like, please follow. Let's encourage each other, mamas. Let's get our kids rooted in the word that they may live in the abundant life Christ died for them to live. And until we meet next time, I thank you for joining me. And I pray that this seed develops deep roots within your heart, creating a harvest of life that the enemy has no power to take. In Jesus' name. We'll see you next time. And I really look forward to it. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Intentional Mama podcast. If today's message resonated with you, or if you think it could bless someone you know, don't hesitate to share it on social media. Your support means the world to us and plays a vital role in spreading the word of God through this ministry. Pray about how you can sow your time, prayers, and finances into this ministry. Go to rootbible.com to learn more. We can't wait to connect with you again next week and continue sowing into your life. Until then, stay intentional, stay blessed, and remember that you are loved.